So, uh, in October of 1936, the first Russian airplanes, tanks, and other supplies began arriving to shore up the Spanish government. So, you see, the, the government of uh, the, the communist government in Russia supports the legitimate uh, Spanish government, the, the, the horrible Spanish government. And clearly at this point, yes, Hitler is technically allied with Stalin. He clearly has designs on Russia. Uh, he was, uh, when talking about, of course, uh, at the end of the First World War, Germany lost all of its overseas possessions. You know, it was, a, in a sense, a late comer to the party, even on purpose, to the imperial party, so to speak. Uh, even on purpose, remember, you may remember, talked about that last year, that Bismarck was opposed to Germany's building an overseas empire for itself. He said, well, for one thing, we don't need it. Uh, that's... <laughs> Germany's not into that sort of thing. And also, that just provides that much more occasion for clashing with the powers with whom we're trying not to clash. Of course, France had an overseas empire, and Britain, most especially, though, had an overseas empire. There was no idea that Germany would ever reconcile with France, but Germany was seeking at that time to come to some understanding with Britain, which, of course, was uh, an empire. Uh, truly, as it was said, the sun never set on the British Empire. It's, that is to say, the, their British possessions were so widespread throughout the globe that there was always some part of the world at every, any time of day you might, any hour of the day, in any time zone that you might choose, there was somewhere in the world that the sun was shining on some British possession. So, <laughs> that, hence the saying, the sun never sets on the British Empire. At least that, that's the idea. So, uh, uh, Britain having this vast overseas empire, uh, uh, Germany not wanting to come to conflict with, with that empire, Bismarck, f as horrible as he was, had at least that much common sense. We don't need it. Any advantages that we might gain from having such an empire will just cause us to come into, potentially into conflict with other imperial powers with whom we're trying not to raise tensions. So uh, Bismarck was out eventually and was, was ousted and was, was removed. Uh, specifically by the, by the Kaiser, who then built up an overseas empire. And Br Germany lost all of those possessions, even during the war, uh, well, in, in, if not entirely, then almost entirely lost its possessions, or a great many of them anyway, uh, in military action. And of course, officially, in the treaty at the end of the war, all of that was gone. And there was some talk, uh, as Germany was rearming itself in defiance of the 1919 treaty, uh, of maybe we should, uh, Germans saying, maybe we should re regain the land that we lost in Africa. And Hitler had, forget about, forget about the territory in Africa. We don't need that. What we need is Russia. Russia was always his number one goal in every way, not only uh, with regard to uh, ideological clashing, which uh, we, we've talked about the differences between Hitler's version of socialism and, and, and Soviet socialism, and that they were uh, the war was really at that. The, the heart of it was, certainly in, in Hitler's mind, a war to determine which form of socialism would be the dominant one. Uh, it was a war of leftists, really. And yes, other, other powers got involved. The Western, liberal Western democracies got involved. But in Hitler's mind, the, the central conflict was that with Russia. Uh, and uh, that, is, that was always his main focus. That was... Um, uh, also, not, not only because of, of those ideological differences, but because he wanted that to be living space. His idea was that uh, Germany would expand out into that uh, into a vast expanse, and that would all become part of a, of a greater Germany, his Reich that would last however a thousand years or whatever he thought. So uh, that, was, uh, that, that, was, that was Hitler's idea of all of this. Uh, and we see already he has designs on Russia already even though he's officially allied with Stalin at this point. Uh, he, was, he knew that wouldn't last and wanted to invade Russia. And this is um, something of a, this was one of the early, uh, early clashes between those two, between Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia. Uh, this became a, something of a proxy war between uh, uh, Hitler and Mussolini on one side and the, and, and the, the Soviet uh, communist empire on the other. So, 
the Russian planes, tanks, other supplies start arriving to assist the Spanish government in October 1936. The Catholic Italian press urged Mussolini to send Italian troops to aid the rebels. By the year's end, he had dispatched thousands of black-shirted militia and soldiers to help Franco. So, in other words, they weren't going there in any official capacity, but they were, they were there anyway. Maybe they weren't in any kind of official uniform, but they were definitely there. And Hitler did the same thing. Our focus is not Hitler right now, but Hitler did the same thing. He sent troops to assist. And there were people you know, uh, from all over, not only Russians came, but there were American volunteers, for example, who fought on the side of the Spanish government. So the Pope did not share in, in the enthusiasm for the war. He was horrified at the blood-curdling accounts of anti-Catholic atrocities, but balked at endorsing an armed revolt against an elected government. So he saw that there, there was no debate, there, there was no question that this government was legitimate, certainly in the sense that it had won those elections. And it was in, in response to that that, uh, that, Hitler, uh, that, uh, that Franco decided to is, initiate his revolt to begin with. Yes? Father, an openly communist uh, that killed every single Catholic can be a legitimate government, or uh, was communist? Yes. Yeah, it, yeah, it, uh, it, it's, it's difficult to say. In principle, a communist government is not a legitimate government, but it's, you have to take each one case by case. Is one thing the ideology of the government and what it actually does in practice. Uh, it, certainly, from the point of view, and it, Pius XI himself clearly was not willing to pronounce on this as being an illegitimate government. So there's no reason why we should imagine ourselves now to be <laughs> equipped to do so. Uh, but it, I mean, it was horrible for sure, and no, no question of that. But it was you know, overwhelmingly, or it was um, it, it, won, it won it won those elections. I don't have the numbers of uh, according to which it won those elections, but and they did not kill every single Catholic. They, they, was, there was persecution of the church, but persecution of the church does not render a government illegitimate, even if it's horrible, even if it ends up killing millions of Catholics. Uh, it's a very, very low bar for the legitimacy of a government. They have, to, they have to take care of the most basic functions of the state, and that makes them legitimate. So in the Roman Empire, for example, uh, there was never any thought in the early, in the early centuries of the church of ever assassinating a Roman emperor. There was, there was never any endorsement to that effect. There was never any attempt on the part of any member of the church to do that. Even there were cases of saints who were members of the imperial household who when they were discovered were horribly put to death. There was never any thought of, well, let's take out this emperor who's persecuting the church, we might get somebody nicer. And there was, not every emperor persecuted the church uh, uh, um, deliberately. Uh, there was always persecution going on somewhere. Sometimes it was an empire-wide program, sometimes it was not. But clearly, the church did not deem, as a result of that, that the, uh, that the, that the Roman emperors were illegitimate, however vigorous their persecution of the church. So in this particular case, uh, perhaps a, uh, yes, a leftist, even communist government uh, in, in, uh, in principle, uh, clearly Pius XI did not denounced this as being an illegitimate government that may be overthrown and whose revolt we are, and this revolt we are uh, supporting. He clearly didn't say that. Uh, he uh, never came out uh, and pronounced upon that. And uh, yeah, in itself, persecution of the church does not render a government illegitimate. So uh, he was, uh, also Pius XI was not eager to see Mussolini embroiled in a war that would push him further into Hitler's arms. He was becoming more and more reliant upon Hitler. And that would, as years went on, that uh, only increased. And just as he was getting the first reports of civil war in Spain, the Pope received more disturbing news from Germany, as we touched upon last year as well. The Nazis were planning to put hundreds of German monks and nuns on trial on charges of sexual perversion. Over the next year, the highly publicized trials would receive front page coverage in the German press. Corruptors of youth clad in cassocks, screamed one headline. The bottomless depravity in the monastery, declared another. So uh, this is uh, actually right here an example of the fact that, uh, of course, the, uh, the, the holiness of the church could never be defiled to any degree at all by the sins of her members, but uh, it can happen that uh, 
that those uh, pers even personal uh, fa failings, see we're talking about serious failings, uh, grave sins, very grave sins here of course, that they can still cause trouble for the church precisely because of this, of this sort of thing. Now, no doubt there was some of it, uh, but no doubt also it was uh, on, on the whole a very small portion of, of the clergy and religious in Germany who were guilty of that. Uh, and uh, nevertheless, uh, the, the Nazis are going to take advantage of that to the, full extent, to the fullest extent possible to cause trouble for the church. So this is one example of a kind of scandal that can arise from even just, yes, the, the, the personal failings of uh, personal grave sins of some members of the church, some members of the clergy, some, some religious who... Um, who give scandal by, by those evil actions. Because uh, remember, in any, any large organization, uh, we're talking about a purely human organization, or uh, we're talking about the church, which has a human element to it, that becomes very large a number, there are going to be some people who fall into this, uh, who, 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 who commit such sins. Uh, when you have large numbers of people, some will be bad, and some will be very bad. No matter, no matter the diligence in trying to s select people who are, who are not, of course, who are, who are not uh, given to n sins of, of such kinds and such nature, still some will get through or some will be corrupted for whatever reason after getting in. And it's, it's impossible to avoid that 100%. Uh, but still can cause damage. It still can cause damage. Uh, in this case, of course, it's one of uh, the, the Nazis wanting to just, you know, just to cause the church trouble because they're, in principle, very anti-Catholic. Uh, that much is, is definitely true. Uh, but also, uh, from another side, the, the Nazis are not exactly the ones to take on the role of, of the guardians of morality, uh, to say the least. Uh, we saw earlier their, their programs of forced sterilization, <laughs> Uh, they did have ideas of a superior race. There's no question of that. Uh, and and yeah, also, uh, they had the, their, their idea was uh, Hitler encouraged soldiers during the war who come home from the front to commit as many acts of fornication as possible to uh, result in a, a greater population for Germany in order to, to, to provide personnel for its war machine in future years. So Nazis are not the guardians of morality by any stretch of the imagination. They have absolutely no room <laughs> to accuse anybody of any kind of immorality. So uh, for them to, of course, it's completely out, it's completely inappropriate for them to try to put the church on trial, period. That's for the church to deal with. In any case ever of someone who was ever put to death in the history of the church after having been convicted either of a sin of this kind or actually which is graver still, sins of heresy, all of that was done by the state after that person had been duly tried by the church and in the case of any member of the clergy, then reduced to the lay state, then handed over to the state for punishment of that same crime, uh, having been reduced to the lay state as that crime is, or that, as that sin is a crime against the civil law. So in, in previous ages, yes, heresy was recognized as being a very, very grave offense against uh, having effects in many different orders. Yes, most importantly, it's a grave sin, uh, extremely offensive to God, sin of heresy, but also is, uh, of course, a crime against canon law, is, and in a, Catholic, in a properly ordered nation, also a crime against the civil law, because it's, it's, a, it's an act of rebellion against God as the author of the supernatural. And Catholic monarchs understood that very clearly. And when, they, and when they recognized that someone was pronouncing heresy, uh, pertinaciously, of course, uh, they were very much interested in bringing that under control for the good of the state, for their own, their own, just in their own sphere of influence. They recognized that their own authority, uh, set up, of course, for, for, to provide for the good of the state, was seriously threatened by this heresy, by, by heresy being pronounced in a pertinacious way. Because uh, anybody who can reject the authority of God as the author of the supernatural 
very easily proceeds to rebellion against God as the author of the natural, the, the natural order, which includes the authority that he grants to the state. So Catholic monarchs have always understood that, and that's why you uh, see also that the crime that heresy was considered to be the, the, the crime of laissez majestatis, of, of treason, it was put on equal footing with treason, heresy. Uh, so you could betray state secrets to an enemy during wartime, or you could pronounce heresy. That's treason in all cases. That's how seriously that was taken, and how, how severely it was punished in the case of those, in the cases of anyone who, of, of all those who were uh, impenitent. So we're returning to our, uh, our topic here. To make matters worse, German authorities had renewed their case against the Jesuits, accused of illegally exporting funds. So yeah, that, that's in the quick handbook for how to persecute the church when you're an anti-Catholic government. It, it's, it's among the first steps is, is persecute the Jesuits, you know, expel them, get them suppressed, whatever, just, just uh, cause them as much trouble as possible. And the reason for that was because uh, not, not, not that these anti-Catholic governments, well, I mean, go, backing up a bit, in some cases, regalist governments, uh, not, not because they had any problem with certain theological positions that the Jesuits had, but because the Jesuits are very good educators. And indeed they were. Uh, and they, these governments understood that they would never have the control over their populations the way they wanted uh, while the Jesuits were still there giving them a Catholic education. So they wanted to get them out for, for those reasons. And yes, they were also very wealthy, and there's always a, a motive of greed as well. That's one of the motives that we're hearing about at a table right now, in fact, <coughs> And the, the author, I don't think, has mentioned it much, but uh, it, it was, in fact, a motive for those, those princes, those, those nobles, those high-ranking nobles, to protect Luther the way they did was because the church had a huge amount of property in Germany. And they, they, they had, there were so many advantages, uh, in a certain sense, uh, for those, those princes, to, for those nobles, to throw off the authority of the church. They, uh, they were... They were now, there were motives of concupiscence, definitely in some cases. Uh, there were political motives, and there were also motives of greed. They were, if, they were, if, they were, uh, if, they, if they embraced Luther's ideas uh, that, that, that the Catholic Church was, was something evil, uh, they, they imagined themselves, therefore, entitled to steal its property, which was immense. So there was also a motive of, of greed there. So the Jesuits, and illegally exporting funds, the, the Jesuits were, were quite wealthy as an order. So, in the summer of 1936, the German bishops had asked the Pope to prepare an encyclical urging the Nazi government to respect the terms of the 1933 Concordat with the Church. So, um, also, yes, uh, to be clear on this, it, the term Nazi, it of course, refers to that specific political party, and uh, it's, it, it is true at this point to describe the German government as Nazi, but, of course, not every German was, in fact, a Nazi. In fact, there were, there were many who were not, uh, even, say, army, high-ranking army generals who were not. In fact, it got to the point that, uh, very famously, a uh, number of, of, of Hitler's prominent army officers tried to assassinate him. It was unsuccessful, but they tried to assassinate him. So, so such was the, uh, the, the contrast in some cases between those who, even within Germany, even within the army, who were members of the party and, and those who were not. So we're talking about the Nazi government is specifically the government. It was not as though every single German was on board with this. So in early 1937, in his sickbed, remember Pius XI would uh, die within the next couple of years, the Pope met with three German cardinals and two bishops who had come to discuss this proposal. Whereas Pacelli, and we're looking at all of this really for our purposes, most immediately uh, we're looking at this in order to give some context for how Pacelli reacts to things. Not wanting to antagonize Hitler, Pacelli advised the Pope against issuing his criticism in the form of an encyclical. So an encyclical is, in essence, a public letter, an open letter, addressed to the clergy, it's either to the, of, the, of, the, of the entire world, so the bishops, uh, archbishops, etc., of the entire world, or of a specific area, uh, but it's really an open letter. It was. Uh, uh, it's actually a fairly, well, I should say, relatively recent development. Uh, does anybody know the first pope to publish an encyclical? It was Pope Benedict XIV, in fact. So it's a relatively recent 
uh, recent comer to the list of papal documents. Uh, and it was published, it was, it was invented, so to speak, it, it, it was brought into being as a, as, a, as a commonly used format by the papacy because in order to promulgate bulls, papal bulls, official documents, it was necessary to have, the, by, by arrangement of the Holy See with various different powers, it was required that the civil ruler cooperate in the promulgation of that bull. So if the civil ruler didn't cooperate, it wasn't considered promulgated in that area. Even by the law of the church, it was not promulgated in that particular area. So, and that, that meant that effectively, when, if there was ever any kind of tension between the Holy See, between, um, uh, for any reason at all, between the church and the state, uh, that the, the civil rulers could effectively stop the Pope from doing anything in that nation by, by simply refusing to publish his bulls as they were supposed to do. And so Benedict XIV found a way around that by, by, by saying, oh, this, is, this is just an encyclical. In fact, it's uh, uh, litere in, in ciclice, encycl an encyclical letter. In Latin, the litere is always plural when, when used that way. Uh, but so an encyclical letter. This is just an open letter. I'm allowed to write letters, right? I can make, I can write one that's, that's, that's an open letter. That's, that's fine. So it didn't, in other words, it was a way of, for the Pope to get out whatever he wanted to say on any matter, whether it was doctrinal, disciplinary, liturgical, whatever, without having to go through the usual channel, so to speak, of getting the cooperation of the civil power. So it's a, it's a common enough question, are encyclicals infallible? And the answer to that is, well, really, the real question to be answered is what degree of assent does any given doctrine in any one encyclical demand? And the answer is that all depends on what the Pope intends. Sometimes a Pope could define something in an encyclical, but uh, the format has nothing to do with it, really. A Pope can define it. He could, he could write a definition on a post-it note <laughs> and send it out. And that's a definition <laughs> if he wanted to. That's uh, asking, is it encyclical and infallible is uh, something like asking today, if there, if there were a pope, is a text message or an email infallible? <laughs> In other words, just the format, just the way of getting the word out. The pope could make a solemn definition, ex cathedra, in an encyclical, should he choose to do so. In fact, Pius XI made a definition in one of his encyclicals. Uh, but that, that's, that's not our focus right now. But the point is that an encyclical is a big deal. <laughs> that's the point. Uh, it is uh, it's a public pronouncement, and in this case, we'll see, was sent out. This was, encyclical came to be, even though Cardinal Pacelli tried to discourage it. This encyclical came to be and was, spread, it was broadcast throughout Germany to be read from the pulpit, no less. So that makes a, a de very definitely an official pronouncement from the Holy See uh, on something, which we'll see. So. Uh, Pacelli argued that the Pope should simply send Hitler a personal letter to be shared only with the German bishops. So not make it an open letter, the way an encyclical is an open letter. Something for the bishops, yes, sent to Hitler also, or mainly for Hitler, sent also to the bishops, but don't make it an open letter, the way an encyclical is. But in this case, Pius XI spurned Pacelli's advice. But then you see what Pacelli's advice constantly is. It's constantly to the effect of you know, be nicer, pull, pull back. Uh, let's not antagonize anybody. Now, sometimes that is the correct course of action, but not always. And arguably, Pius XII took that as Pope, took that much further than it should have been taken. So Pius XI wanted to issue an encyclical that all the Germans and all the world would read. And certainly he did so. The fact that we're still talking about it now means that <laughs> that end was accomplished. So the result was undeniably dramatic. On Palm Sunday, March 21st, 1937, bishops and priests throughout Germany read the encyclical Mit Brenner Zorka, so with deep anxiety or with burning anxiety. They read it from the pulpit to people unaccustomed to any public criticism of the Nazi regime. We have some excerpts from it here, which are good to keep in mind. So. The, the opening words, it is with deep anxiety, the, the way in which encyclicals are usually named, there's the first few words are taken from it. So this one was written in German. Usually encyclicals are written in Latin, sometimes in Italian or French. Um, here you have a relatively rare example of one being published in German. 
when the English translation begins with, it is with deep anxiety and growing surprise that we have long been following the painful trials of the church and the increasing vexations which afflict those who have remained loyal in heart and action in the midst of a people that once received from St. Boniface the bright message and the gospel of Christ and God's kingdom. St. Boniface, indeed, was the one who famously cut down a tree that was being worshipped by Germanic tribes. And uh, he, was, he convinced them of the, of the truth of the faith when he cut down this tree that they, convinced, that they were convinced was a divinity without himself getting struck down. So, they, okay, he must be right there. <laughs> so at that point, he managed it. He, that, that, that was a breakthrough moment uh, in the evangelization of the Germans. So whoever exalts race, or the people, or the state, or a, particular, or a particular form of state, or the depositories of power, or any other fundamental value of the human community, however necessary and honorable be their function in worldly things, whoever raises these notions above their standing standard value and divinizes them to an idolatrous level, distorts and perverts an order of the world planned and created by God. He is far from the true faith in God and from the concept of life which that faith upholds. Oh, well, we'll stop there for now. But uh, anyway, some of these, we're only looking at some excerpts from this encyclical. As with every encyclical, it gets quite involved. But it's uh, excellent to, to take note of these things. De general principles he's stating here purposely does not name the Nazis or, or name Hitler or anybody else, but it's clear what he's talking about here. And the, and the principles that are as enunciated are, as, as is always the case in encyclicals, are, are excellent. <laughs>